So I think we, we, we just like, I mean, the first question is just basically a very contemporary um, situation in Nigeria, all over the world. Um, the news today, the talk is about uh, IMF yesterday saying um, there's some kind of positive, uh, projecting positive growth in Africa and Nigeria in general based on the vaccine, rollout of the vaccine. Uh, well, fine, that's news to chair, uh, but we're seeing a different uh, res a response um, in addition to the rollout of vaccines elsewhere. We also seen heavy expenditure um, on, on the part of government, say the United States uh, infrastructure, particularly. Uh, what do you think? Okay, and uh, for business leaders now, rather than government, because uh, obviously the government of Nigeria and the government in the US probably have different virtues with managing the size of um, things, but we know that the Nigerian businesses have shown that even within just some, some background. Even within the pandemic, we saw a lot of money go into health facilities from the private sector. It's sort of like you know, putting their money that you know, yeah, it's somewhere you can invest in. So, what would your advice? I mean, you have a global perspective. What would your advice be to Nigerian businesses? What do they have to do to thrive? Given um, as we're coming out of the pandemic, and but we have seen a lot of big economic global shifts in the horizon. You know, uh, to be tell you, one of the one of the unique things about this pandemic, for those of us that are students of um, of shifts in in economic strategy and positioning, is that mm -hmm. th this is one pandemic that essentially uh, put all of us back on the starting starting line. It's like a hundred yard dash, and. Mm -hmm. So many American institutions and Western institutions were, uh, they were almost at the end of the, of the race. And, you know, mm -hmm. some of us were just, um, just putting on our gear and getting ready to start. Um, mm -hmm. And we knew that we would, it would be very difficult for us to ever catch them. What the mm -hmm. pandemic did was put all of us at the starting, starting line. Well, wow. wow. it, it was the greatest, gonna... the greatest equalizer of all time. Mm -hmm. Mm. It, it, it said to us, whatever you're doing, however you're doing, this pandemic essentially erased the competitive advantage that so many organizations had. And, mm. it, and it, it gives what I would characterize as new starters uh, or new entrants, um, like places like Nigeria, a, a mm. real opportunity to to be able to play with the big boys, and more importantly, oh. to become big themselves, um, and so I, I think that's that, that premise is is very important that we 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 state that from the onset. Um, mm. Secondly, what the pandemic has done again is expose us to the reality that every country must identify a competitive advantage, you know, and and the way. I, I describe competitive advantage is very simple, is what you do that nobody can do better than you. <laughs> you, know, you know, we, we get into all this economic definition of competitive advantage. You know, just, if, you're, if you're good at what you do to the extent that, <laughs> that, that nobody is better than you, you've got a competitive advantage. Mm. And if you, if, you, if you don't, you don't. Um, and so it, it, what the mistake that organizations make is that they tend to think of competitive advantage as being five or six or 10 or 20 things. No, mm -hmm. competitive advantage is one or two things that you've invested in, that you've been tested in, that you that you know that you're really good in, that you can deliver. Um, and, and I think that every institution, every organization, and even, even state governments, and perhaps even countries should mm -hmm. identify what they are very good at and to invest in that area. Um, mm. and, and so as we move forward, some of the unique opportunities in competitive advantage is technology now, yeah. where your ability to be able to bring your products and to bring your services to the market uh, in real time has mm. been enhanced. Yes. Uh, you, your ability to be able to solve people's problems mm to solve the biggest problems in the world has been significantly enhanced. And, mm -hmm. and now you can compete with whoever the other problem solvers are because you can deliver your products and services to the market. 
quicker, mm. more efficiently. And at the end of the day, people don't really give a damn whether where it's coming from. They yeah. just they want they just want their problems solved. And yeah. and so for for organizations that see themselves in this particular light, I I think there's some there's some big problem there's some big opportunities. So let me just throw some examples at you. Uh, okay. I, I I really believe that the banking space in Niger in Nigeria is one of the most progressive, um, one of the most creative um, areas that we've got. We we've got some remarkable minds um, doing banking in Nigeria. They've taken this banking concept of sort of the to to so many of the unbanked that they've yeah. actually empowered people to to be able to put money in the bank keep it there, mm -hmm. grow it, and then be able to have access. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am waiting for um, one or two Nigerian banks to make a play at, at, at acquisition, acquiring an American bank. It's got, wow. it's got, it's got to happen. It has to happen. Really? Uh, yeah, it has to happen. Uh, and the, the, first, the first Nigerian institution that does that will be will be so well positioned uh, that it it'll be it, it'll be what I call a game changing event. Hmm. Um, and 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 the reality is, it, it doesn't have to be any of the name brands that we're familiar with. It doesn't have to be any of the top ten banks. What they need is just make an entry into the business into the banking space in the United States hmm. to the extent where you know you you make a you make a small acquisition in a in a small market, and mm -hmm. then you use that as a trajectory point to be able to establish your base in um, in in the U.S. Um, I, I think I think that the pandemic has given has given us that opportunity to to be able to do that, uh, and that they can bring all these creative innovations that are now playing out in Nigeria. They can bring that to the U.S. market even so, because the U.S. market, when you think about the financial and banking space, is is highly sophisticated. But but the, the Nigerian the Nigerian processes in banking and financing is right up there, yeah. <laughs> and and so I, I see some real opportunities for us in, in that line. Amazing, you know. Amazing. Se se secondly, you know, when we when we're talking about vaccinations, I've been waiting. And I guess I'm gonna to have to wait even longer. That some of the Nigerian universities um, may have come up with their own own remedy to contain this virus. Um, with all the variants that are going going on, you know, out there, mm -hmm. I was expecting that um, that we would have seen um, some very unique responses to to vaccinations. Um, that would essentially give Nigeria a an up close um, competitive positioning when it has to do with um, vaccination of um, of Africans. You know, mm. we have over a billion plus Africans yeah, yeah. that are not going to get access there, and if they're waiting on on um, mm. or they're mm. waiting on or Jay John, yeah, Johnson and Johnson. To be able to resolve this for this, it is it is another missed opportunity. We should mm. be creatively inventive enough to be able to do um, to be able to do all that. Um, mm. I, I I on the health on the health, on the health sector side as well. I, I think a lot of young people need to start thinking about how are they going to meet the meet that gap of providing health services. To yeah. those that can afford it, those yeah. that, that that need it, and to be able to show that the health services that we're providing is just not some kind of rudimentary process, people are actually yeah. being cured, that their yeah. that their elements are being addressed. I, I I still believe that's a that's a wide open opportunity there, in the Nigerian mm -hmm. space. It's it's an investment that is worthy, and it can be done in a couple of ways. You you don't have to build. A large structural hospital system. We got a lot of buildings in Nigeria, but there's nothing mm -hmm. inside. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I think it, it begins with probably collaboration with American and American-based uh, healthcare systems, where um, a, a lot of that can be done through through technology, uh, you know, and mm -hmm. to to be able to be able to diagnose, uh, mm -hmm. assess, 
and then be able to provide treatment and even surgeries could be telegraphed from here over there um, and at a very significantly reduced cost. So when you, when you think about the, gener the generation of medical students and graduates that have come out uh, of the great institutions in Nigeria that are now unemployed, um, it, this, is this, this is the time where they need to think of the business side of how they might be critical um, players in this particular space. Um, well, so I, just, just some ideas that are coming to me uh, mm. in, terms of, um, in terms of opportunities out there. Oh, good. Because uh, you mentioned uh, the thing about doctors who are graduating, Nigerian doctors who are graduating. Well, while not all of them, I mean, some, uh, uh, yes, you're right, uh, the, the issues with getting a job or starting out, we have some of them actually living, uh, forming, as you say, another wave of, um, another, another wave of exodus of, of, of you say, brain drain of people living in the country. And, and this, is, this has been happening over the years in waves that now gradually we have this huge um, diaspora Nigerians that are called the secret source of the country's success. Um, how come we're seeing and hearing a lot about them these days? Because we're seeing, I mean, especially during the pandemic, we saw from mayors to doctors who worked on the vaccine, to mayors who, who, uh, who oversaw the rollout in their areas to, I mean, just, Nigerians doing great jobs everywhere, all over the US, all over the world. So what impact can they have um, in terms of all of these things you've mentioned uh, that can, can go on in Nigeria, in the health sector, in the banking sector? You, you, you know, the, the, the Nigerians have always been so relentless and um, inventful mm -hmm. and, and very hungry, you know, because that's where we were brought, we were brought, we were brought up not to take anything for granted. Um, mm -hmm. The, 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 the Nigerians in the diaspora uh, here in the U.S. have have have, have always been very very um, creative and with great results. But what has happened is that everybody kind of focused on whatever job they were doing. They didn't really care about publicity. They were mm -hmm. just having an impact. But with yeah. the advent of um, of all these uh, social media outlets now. Uh, they're being they're being revealed. Their their good mm, work is mm. being uh, is now on the forefront. Um, but they've always been there. Um, yeah. and, and so when I when I think about that, in, in a number of my colleagues in so many space, in so many different areas. When there's, I, I had a privilege a couple of weeks ago, to a couple of months ago, to speak mm -hmm. to a group in Cleveland, Ohio, and that group uh, they had they had contacted me. And honored me as their, um, you know, maybe Nigerian of the Year or something, you know. And, uh, uh, congrats! And so I, I had the opportunity to speak to the group, mm. and I gotta tell you, Tyler, what was interesting is that group on Zoom were representative of some of the greatest minds in medicine, mm. and that I that I have ever had the chance to speak to. Forget the fact that they're Nigerians; they're, these guys were just unbelievable. Okay. And, uh, and, and so I, I challenged them that, you know, hey guys, you guys have been making money for so many uh, uh, medical institutions in the United States for some of you guys for the last 40 years. Um, what are you doing about Nigeria? What, what are you doing to break into that market um, and to, to, really have a, to really have an impact? Yeah. And of course, what you, what you hear from them is the frustration of yeah. being able to play in that market. The, the inability of, of the lack of support, um, the, the, the roadblocks that are self-inflicted. Mm. And, and they say they don't have time for that. They'd rather just mm. continue to do what they're doing, do what they're doing in mm. the United States. And, and so mm. you, 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 but you have a, a restless group of Nigerians here that realize that as successful as they are in the States, that the, re the, the recognition that real success for them is not here, mm. is what they can do over there. Mm. Yeah. And as, as we get older and we start moving towards our gray years um, mm -hmm. and where we, we're, we're sitting back and we can thank God for all, all the bountiful opportunities that we've been able to amass, you start mm -hmm. thinking, um, how do I want to be remembered? Uh, when, when my chair is cold and empty, you start yeah. thinking about, um, you know, yeah, I can I can pass all this on to my kids, 
but how about, how about the things that I can pass on to a greater population of my, mm -hmm. my fellow Nigerians, wherever they are? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that conversation is taking place now. And I think you're, you, what I would say is that we, we need a catalyst mm. at, the, at the state level and perhaps maybe at the federal level that really puts in play the opportunity for Nigerians in the diaspora to, to be able to cross that bridge and to come home. And, and, I, and, and I think one of the key examples of that title is, is that for, some of, for most of us that have studied in the United States that came here early, came here for undergraduate, and then went on to graduate school and all that. Well, one of the big challenges is that you've got, you've got this Nigerian Americans that are going to start emerging in American politics. You're gonna start seeing them at mail mm -hmm. levels, at congressional levels, at Senate mm -hmm. levels. And at some point you'll see them at the presidential level. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, the already. Point, yeah, they're already, but the, the key point is that the reason why they're playing here is because they can't play back home because yeah. of crazy, crazy regulation, regulations that keeps them from being able to participate. And mm. it's a damn shame because, you know, the, these guys can change the culture and the accountability yeah. aspect that, that mm. currently exists. I, I, I'll give you an example. Um, my, one of my younger sisters, um, A. Bola Akonde is her name. You can check her up on LinkedIn. Mm. She, is, she is my immediate younger sister. She is a city administrator for a for the, for a city in in Missouri, a city called mm. Brentwood. Uh, Bola oversees the day to day operation of that city, multi million dollar budget. Um, wow. Whether it's the police department, whether it's the parks and recreations, whether it's construction, whether it's infrastructure, wow. they all report to by Sister Bola. And and I, and I keep telling Bola, I said, you know, a lot of the things that you do, they're just Things that you do. He said a lot of our local governments in Nigeria could benefit from it, both yeah. in terms of the execution and the ideas. Yeah. And, yeah. And, I, and, I, and I said that you can share this idea with them free of charge because you don't, you know, you're not doing it to for any kind of room, you know, any kind of remuneration. Mm -hmm. And she, she said, Yeah, but wait, how do I get in? How do I mm -hmm. provide an opportunity mm -hmm. to be able to do these things? Mm -hmm. And um, and and you see you see so many others like that. Uh, yeah. that are sort of not, you know, that not being given the opportunity. And so my, my, mm. my advice to the government, and I, I, would, I would love to engage, you know, the current administration in Abuja with this, is to establish an office of what you call diaspora engagement. Mm. And that office is charged with serving as the bridge between Nigeria and the diaspora to yeah. bring people in, to engage them, whether it's in engineering, whether it's in science, whether it's in technology, the role is to be able to get these individuals to bring their relationships to Nigeria and their intellectual capacity. I, mm. I, I think that the Office of Diaspora Engagement will go a long way to setting up a wave of ideas and investments that could, mm. that could, that could dramatically change Nigeria uh, in a very short period of time. I, I think well, that, that, would, that would be my my initial recommendations from that perspective. Okay, so so what would you then say? Because uh, I mean, uh, the if you look at so these people hungry, um, high achieving um, uh, Nigerian Americans or Nigerians, <coughs> excuse me, America, um, looking for a bridge into the country, um, but at the same time, as you said, the roadblocks. Uh, Nigeria is not seen as a great destination for investments. Right now, so apart from say this having an office for um, engaging the Nigerians in diaspora, how can we rise above this with creative ideas, especially as we're seeing also that restlessness among the youth here in Nigeria and even um, the same youth in businesses like fintech, uh, Nigerian fintechs in one month raised more than all they raised in 2020. So that they're based here, they're working here, and they're voicing their concerns over the internet. How can this this same energy be tapped into? Well, you, you, I think that's a very good question, Tayo, because um, I think the best way to tap into that energy is to support uh, those that are particularly playing that that space. And mm -hmm. and for me, I, I wouldn't go into the. I, I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even suggest that that support needs to come from the government. 
Uh, that that's a private sector kind of thing. I I would exactly. I would think that every major bank in Nigeria, uh, and those highly highly endowed and wealthy Nigerians, um, should set up a a a a process where there's a there's a pool of money, um, you know, sort of available to venture capital, essentially. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, the, the challenge for every one of our very established and wealthy Nigerians is to set up venture capital entities that that and to staff it appropriately that allows these young up and coming Nigerians with remarkable entrepreneurial ideas to be able to come and make their case. And, and, and that's that's how Silicon Valley took off here in the United States. You, you yeah. had these billionaires that set up these venture capital funds that invested that, that invested in these ideas with the notion that um if, if it, they took equity position and that it, whether it was google I, I remember when twitter uh was on what's in its offspring and and um jack uh, dorsey who is mm -hmm. the founder of twitter and a a native st louis um young man someone that i met ah, about 12 wow. 15 years ago when in the initial days of twitter what Jack did was that he came back to St. Louis mm. and he started talking to people about this concept that he had and that, uh, but he needed money to be able to take it, to, to stand it up. And so his initial, most of his initial investment came from his, from his own community where he grew mm. up. Mm -hmm. And these folks invested in the idea, invested in setting up Twitter. And so when Twitter eventually went public and literally overnight it, it went from a, from a concept to a to a brand to a household name, mm -hmm. all those venture capital investors who are based in St. Louis became multimillionaires and some even billionaires as a result wow. of that. And and so wow. if 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 Nigerian wealthy people are thinking about a way to grow their funds, that that venture capital funds are probably the best way to do it. It's not about building houses. It's not about mm -hmm. how big your house is. It's not about how, mm -hmm. you know, how many cars you got in your parking garage. No, 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 no. If you really want to have your money work for you, you got to yeah. invest in the future. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's where I see some real opportunities to be able to lift up um, mm -hmm. you know, those, those Nigerians ideas. Secondly, I, I think um, there, there are enough ideas in Nigeria right now with our young people, not just to transform Nigeria, but to have a, to have a meaningful impact globally. Mm. Um, and we've got to establish a way to be able to sieve out which one of those ideas are really good and which ones can be, yeah. can be very successful. And, yeah. and again, I would, I would say investing in, in opportunities for those ideas to be brought to the table uh, and also providing the legal backing to ensure that those ideas are not stolen. Because one of the yeah. biggest challenges that these young people have is, you know, I bring my ideas to the table but is, is my intellectual property is it is it protected? We've got mm -hmm. to we've got to establish laws that ensures that if you steal somebody's intellectual property, that they that they can they can find a way to 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 mm -hmm. seek retribution in those in that regard. I think that's one of the biggest fears. Very that important. Yeah. That's quite important. Yeah. 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 So yeah. so I, 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 that that would be my my sort of my immediate response to. You know, to have, you know, and I, and I think those venture capital funds could be could be set up um, through financial institutions, or, or mm. perhaps maybe maybe not non financial institutions. I, I think that could be an opportunity as well. But you are you are an investor yourself and a business leader leader, and you I mean you sit on a number of corporate boards. Um, what changes are you seeing um, in the investment environment post COVID nineteen? Since we're just still talking about investment opportunities, but what what opportunities are you seeing? From that, um, um, from that position you have as a as a business leader sitting in a number of corporate boards. Tayo, I'm I'm seeing organizations move quicker than I've ever seen them before. It's they're moving so quick you can't even. You, it's it's hard to comprehend, man. Um, and and they particularly when it comes to you know taking advantage of opportunities, um, yeah. because I think people are realizing that. Um, um, the, the ability to move in real time is 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 in, is in itself a competitive advantage, 
um, I'm, I'm seeing um, different layers of investments um, in technology and enabling um, engagement, um, whether it's in the health space, whether it's in, it's in the infrastructure uh, space. Um, I, I'm also seeing a, the return, return to work where people are saying, okay, we've been, we've been down for over a year now. How do we go back to work? But that re-entry, how, how is that a re re-entry going to be very different from um, the way we did this before the pandemic? Um, sort yeah. of a post, a change of a post-pandemic um, sort of um, um, mentality of sorts. Um, I'm, I'm seeing, I think we're gonna see in the next couple of months, a, a quite a bit of mergers and acquisitions. A, you know, where a, a lot of com organizations that were competitors before are going to, you know, come together um, mm -hmm. and, and build a very formidable entity that will be able to go further in the, in the post-pandemic world. You, you mm -hmm. see that opportunity, you see that happening more and more at, in, in all spaces, whether it's in the financial services, your financial institutions, banking, uh, you, mm -hmm. you, you, you'll see some big plays. You'll probably see, and, and one of the unique aspects is you see small organizations taking over big organizations. Mm -hmm. Actually, something that is sort of an anomaly, it's like, how, how can I, I kind yeah. of small child, you know, <laughs> buy something, but, but but with with funding opportunities out there, you can borrow money to buy somebody big, and yeah. and and I, I think you you start seeing moves in that particular area. You start seeing more inter international um, engagement, um, where you know it's you, you you especially from U.S. companies who are now scanning the world. Mm -hmm. looking for real possibilities and new opportunities um, and, and finding them, um, you, you see, you see multi-level verticals being built where, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, organizations that, um, you know, for instance, were in a, in a space that, um, I, I'll give you a very interesting thought that I was having the other day. Uh, when, you, when you think about the need of health healthcare in Nigeria, yeah. And the lack of it. What I what I see as a, a, a possible new wave that may occur will be some of the large business entities in Nigeria opening up their own clinics. Yeah. So instead of sending my employee to UCH or Unilag or Bobi or whatever that deal is, you you'll be able to take care of them within your own you know, sort of healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. um, and that that would in itself would do two things. It will keep your employees healthy, keep them from dying, <laughs> keep them completely loyal to your organization. And yeah. you can make an investment by actually creating a health system within your entity. So that becomes a, a, a vibrant benefits to your, mm -hmm. to your employees. I, I, I think because the state has failed us, the federal government mm -hmm. has failed us. And so yeah. you're going to start building infrastructures that will support your business. I think you're going to start seeing a wave of that uh, in Nigeria that would be very, very significant. Wow, wow. So, uh, so you, would, you would say, I mean, would you, so would you say that investors are looking at the post-COVID uh, period differently from the, uh, how they used to? I mean, it requires a different uh, pair of lenses. So you better, you better go into this post-COVID era very different than you, whatever you were doing before, before this COVID mm -hmm. thing showed up. Because if you don't, you, 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 are, you are automatically irrelevant. Wow. And, and Tayo, let me say this to you, man. Irrelevancy is worse than death. Mm -hmm. Irrelevancy is worse than death. Because when you become irrelevant, that means at, at one point you were relevant. At one point you, you are making waves. You are having an impact. You are pro you are producing a product <laughs> service that yeah. people people galvanize towards. But then, when you become irrelevant, that means something happened here. Somebody took away your market share. Somebody took yeah. away the the things that you used to do, but now they can do it better. And but mm -hmm. but you're still around to to watch all this happen, and you're powerless. <laughs> you you're well. not able to <laughs> you're not able to do anything about it. And that's why I say that becoming irrelevant yes. is worse than death because you're still around to see all the things that you built 
gradually be taken away from you. Um, yeah. And so I, I think I think organizations that are not bold enough, that are scared, mm -hmm. that are not that are not that are, that are not courageous, are going to find themselves in a state of irrelevancy. Um, and and because they just thought that they could just simply go back to the way that they were doing things pre pre pandemic, mm -hmm. and then they find out that the world has changed. Yeah. And, I, and I think the organizations like that are are really going to be the ones that are holding the short end of the stick when this thing is all said and done. So, so that speaks, uh, I imagine, to, to leadership, because it's not just the organization, but those at the top of those organizations. Those are the ones who have to lead, who have to be in the forefront. And you're starting an executive leadership session um, called Executive Leadership Session with Dr. Benjamin Ola Kunde. It's starting off in April. Who, who, who's your target audience? And what should, you, or what should they be expecting? My, my targeted audience are, let me, let me tell you who I don't want. <laughs> I, I, I don't want people that are looking to just, um, you know, sort of punch the card as another executive professional development session that they took and mm -hmm. they can, they can sort of check it off as, um, you know, what they have to do this year, they can move forward. I don't, I don't need those folks. They're, they should seek other, other avenues to, to do that. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking for are individuals that are really, really open to, to having the conversations about innovation, about mm -hmm. the, the, the act, the, the art and science of leading from where you are. Mm -hmm. the, the folks that are not willing to seek permission to do what leaders do, that, that is to mm -hmm. move organizations. Um, yeah. And I, I'm looking for, for the young and the mighty that are thinking creatively about how do I break barriers? How, mm -hmm. how do I bring creativity and innovations to Nigeria that would mm -hmm. change lives? Um, I'm, I'm looking for folks that, are, that they have a very open valve about ideas, mm -hmm. uh, that are willing to challenge me about, you know, share with us areas where you've succeeded and share with us the, the areas where you failed along the way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my, my father, God, God rest his soul, mm -hmm. always used to tell my sisters and I that it is important that we learn from the mistakes of others yeah. because we can't live long enough to make them all ourselves. <laughs> and, and, well. and yeah, so you gotta think about, look at not just about the successes, it's not, we learn more from our from our failures mm. than we do our successes, and mm. and I think that um, I will be sharing with this group not just success factors, but the things that would that could fail you, that could bring you failure yeah. and, and impede yeah. your success. I would mm. I would share stories of um, of innovation. I would share stories of encounter with mm -hmm. uh, with individuals. I, I one of the stories that I love to tell people was my meeting with um, Sam Walton in 19, mm. I believe it was in 1989 or That's 90. It. And Sam Walton is the founder of Walmart. Yeah. And if you know, Walmart is the largest retail uh, in the world. Yeah. It, it, makes, it makes ShopRite looks like, look like, um, um, you know, look, look like a child's play when you think about Walmart. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I had an opportunity to sit down over breakfast uh, with, with the founder of Walmart and, and, and to engage him. I'll be, it, was, it was a 45 minute breakfast session uh, mm. with my students at that time. You know, how, how do you come up with a concept like Walmart? Yeah. And he said, Benjamin, yeah. the reason we did this was that we wanted to create an opportunity for poor people to have access to all the things that rich people have. Mm. and to make it available and make it affordable. Yeah. Yeah. And he's done that, not just in the United States. You go to, you yeah. go to China, you got Walmart. You, yeah. you, go, you go to different parts of the world, you got Walmart. And, and it was that enterprising and entrepreneurial creativity that, that led to the ultimate pivot in the retail space. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm hoping that this session will be one in which we will share ideas we would also use this as a networking opportunity for us to continue to have a relationship. Because I, I believe that um, 
oftentimes it's not the people that you know that matter, it's the people that know you. And so yeah, it's, yeah. it's important for us to be op open up to encourage mm -hmm. them to connect with each other on LinkedIn mm -hmm. um, and for us to continue the conversation way yeah. beyond the, the time that we spend together next week. And so those, those are some of the things that I'm hoping we'll have some conversations on um, during this session. Well, so, so I mean, one final point, because you've spoken a lot about leadership and uh, so very wise insights there. Um, would you consider leadership um, and an event such as yours um, a necessity at this time and, and why? Tyrell, I, I, am, I am very concerned about what's going on in my native country of Nigeria. I, I am concerned that our leaders have become followers. They've become very, very good followers. They, they take the temperature, they wait to see what direction the masses are going, and then they get in front of the line. They get in front of them. Um, <laughs> they're no longer leading but they're just they're just following with leadership titles. I'm, I'm concerned that Nigeria may become another failed state, where our potentials never really caught up with us, and that we squandered our potential because we did not value what we had. And I'm I'm concerned that we are moving towards a a very predictable and mm. that would that would lead to disaster for mm. my 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 beloved country and when mm. you when you when you see what's going on with the the, the ethnic divide when mm -hmm. you see what's going on with kidnapping mm -hmm. um, because of course kidnapping today in Nigeria is a means of um, what i call income distribution or redistribution mm. where people are wow. finding ways to wow. take from those that have, um, and because this, the, the gap continues to widen, and and those that don't have it, they have not. So saying, I've got, I've got to, I've got to find a way to get my, to get mine, and that's why you're seeing mm. a level of kidnapping at the level that we've never seen before. Um, this is the time, Tayo, where leaders are going to emerge in Nigeria, mm. and they'll be the ones with the ideas the ones with solutions, the ones that can, that can solve problems. Um, because what true leadership is, is the ability to solve problems before they become emergencies. And, and now when you look at the political landscape in Nigeria, we don't have leaders. They've disappointed us. And, um, and those that are trying to lead amongst them are, are a minority of sorts. Um, and so, Tayo, I, I, I think that um, more than ever, leadership is needed in Nigeria, and it's not going to come from the conventional space. It's going to mm -hmm. come from mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the least expected places. And, um, well, and I really believe that um, Nigeria is due a revolution. We haven't had one. And any country that wants to move forward, they want to have progress. You can't. You got to do it through revolutions, and and the, and the revolutions that you, that take place now doesn't have to be a violent one. No, 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 no. It just essentially extract mm. the virtue of leadership from those that currently have it, and gives it to those that can mm. move us forward. And that's where we find ourselves right now mm. in Nigeria. And um, and I, I I continue to be an optimist. But I gotta tell you, I'm running out of optimism. Thank you so much, Prof. This is this is. Uh, I mean, it's we're, we're ending with a very, uh, I won't say uh, low tone, but I think it's uh, the gravity of, of what's at stake. I think it's it's quite a tone may, may be like this, but I think it's been a wonderful session, uh, it's, it's quite. Um, thought provoking and I um, mean it, 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 a, a different look at things that one might have taken for granted and uh, I look forward to you know, the executive leadership session that you're starting and wish you all the best. Tao, thank you so thank much. You so much. Uh, Tao, are we are we connected on LinkedIn? 
No, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Do you, do you have a, do you have a presence on LinkedIn? I do. Yes, I do. Yeah. Make sure that your presence, um, that your profile is comprehensive. Yeah. Um, you know, put your, put your good looking picture on there, you know, so people can see that you're dynamic and, <laughs> um, and connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, yes, I would love to, and I'll, I'll accept that connection. And what ha what happens is once you connect with me on LinkedIn, you, you are also directly connected with my 22,000 relationships. Wow. On LinkedIn. Wow. And when you look at those relationships, Tyler, you'll probably find almost immediately once we connect that there are some people that you know that I know, but yeah. now that we know that, that, that now you know that I know, that now that we know all about each other, yeah. we can begin to think about working together. So exactly. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to... I'll to continue this conversation with you. And uh, if there's anything I can do, Tayo, um, in your professional journey or otherwise, um, don't ever hesitate to, um, to ask. Um, I, Thank you so much. I, you, you, never, you never know, you know who might be in, how we might be in a position to help each other. Um, so yeah. don't, you know, let's take advantage of this opportunity and move, move our relationship forward together. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Bye, everybody.